Hello and welcome. Today I'd like to introduce you to Death in the Last Carriage, a Fastiniog railway story by Joseph Harding. D.I. Byron Unsworth's working holiday on a heritage railway in Wales is rudely interrupted by the discovery of a corpse on the train he was responsible for. It shouldn't be his problem, except that the North Wales Police Force is stretched to breaking point with widespread civil unrest. It is a clear case of suicide. Would he wrap up the case for them? No one, least of all Detective Inspector Unsworth, could have foreseen the potentially catastrophic outcome that the death in the last carriage would produce. A pacey detective thriller which gives centre stage to the most enduring and authentic player, the vibrant Festiniog Railway. Great scenery and murder lead to danger on the gravity train, plus more. An excellent read with D.I. Byron Unsworth and his two bagmen, Bagman 1 being Officer Dylan Woods, and Bagman 2 being Unsworth's disabled wife who nags, in a good way, investigating what seems at first to be a suicide. Tension mounts progressively as more information comes to light, and some people are more than what they seem, until we smash into action with the gravity train, with more to come in the form of environmental damage and terrorism. Dream sequences can be a little annoying, but the short one here adds depth to the story. Great relationships, all three-dimensional, with plenty of local history, local Welsh politics and local colour. At times I wanted a map, perhaps that could be added. Great scene setting and build up. And nothing can go wrong in a great yarn when you have a woman entering the scene with a pistol in her hand, ready to fire. I look forward to more D.I. Byron Unsworth. Now I'd like to read you a small excerpt from Death in the Last Carriage by Joe Harding. I hope I can do it some justice. The train whistle sounded the approach to Rhea Goch, a mournful wail that rolled around the moist woodlands and blanketing cloud. Whoever designed that whistle knew their geography. The main rock veil had changed little for centuries. Deep Ancient oak woodlands clinging for grim life to clefted rocky slopes with pockets of marshy ground feeding a multitude of tidy streams that hurled themselves into fast flowing rivers racing to dilute the sea. Some fed dams and hydroelectric power stations along the way, but their presence was no more than an interruption in their headlong progress. Isolated hamlets were sprinkled around the place, chapels converted to houses, small farms and garages. Higher up, around Bleno Festiniog, the grey piles of slate teetering precariously on the mountain slopes threatened to engulf the buildings below. The long, keening whistle gave voice to the brooding mountains, eviscerated of their slate hearts, the mist-dripping trees, the weaning kites, the sunlight glimmering on the distant estuary and the tangible sense of timeless grandeur. It was an old, achingly beautiful landscape, but without Marlene, it lost some of its appeal. The train whistled again, summing up the melancholy Byron felt. There were no passengers waiting at Penryn and only a handful wanting to alight at Minford. By the time the train was crossing the cob, some of the lost time had been recovered. None of the spectacular mountain peaks inland were visible, and rain was lashing in from the sea driven by a wind that buffeted the carriages. Ahead, Moli Guest was shrouded in murk. As they swayed to a halt at harbour, Byron went back along the train, checking windows and collecting the rubbish from the tables. He bumped into Marta in the buffet car. She saw the bag of waste he was holding. Thanks for doing that, Byron. Shall I do the doors? You sure, Marta? Uh, you did them at Blano. Besides, it's chucking it down out there. 
a brief quizzical look as she registered the unfamiliar English expression. Then, no worries, we have rain in Poland too. Up ahead, the fireman down on the tracks and coupling the loco gave a soggy thumbs up to the driver, and the engine, lightened of its load, sprang forward towards the coal bunkers at the end of the station. Once refuelled, it would make its solitary way back across the cob to the workshops where the residual ash would be cleaned out and the engine spruced up for the start of another working week. The rain was coming in horizontally now. Byron shivered as he gathered his rosters together and glanced at his notebook. So much to do, but the weather forecast promised fine for much of Monday. He resolved that unless a dire emergency arose, he would keep his promise to Marlene and take the day off for a long walk. He shrugged up his collar against the rain, but as he walked towards the station, cold tendrils of water crept down his neck. He shivered. The hog roast at Minford would be a grim affair tonight. Byron, come back, please. He spun around. Marta was running down a platform, her hair flapping in the wind and her steward's uniform blackening with the rain. What is it, Marta? She seemed breathless, which was odd. Marta could and did run half marathons for a pastime. Please, she choked, heaving great gasping breaths. You need to see this. He had to wipe the rain off his glasses to see, to follow her slim figure, as she led him back up the carriages. Past the standard class, the buffet, several more newer coaches, the gloss of their varnish deepened by the rain. Past the open wagon to the last carriage, the ancient green coach, smaller and squatter than its companions. Marta hung back as Byron approached. The only open door was swinging in the wind. He had to catch it to avoid it slamming back on him as he peered inside the dark interior. He knew what he was about to see. He had witnessed violent death many times. It is rarely dignified. Dead people don't feel discomfort. They don't care if they are wet or collapsed in an awkward position. They don't care if their clothes are racked up or they have broken limbs. They lie where they die. The man he had seen asleep in the last carriage was not going to wake up. He had pitched sideways and slipped half on, half off the cushioned seat. The platform lamp shining through the window illuminated his outstretched right finger pointing accusingly at a small handgun at his feet. A pool of blood had collected beside his head and overflowed onto the floor. Marta slumped against him, her shallow breaths rustling in his ear. Well, I hope that leaves you with a good taster of Death in the Last Carriage by Joe Harding. I enjoyed the book, okay? Um, now, of course, there's some great characters in there, but perhaps one could argue, and this is no disrespect to Byron Unsworth or to Joe Harding, perhaps the greatest character is the Festinio Railway itself. I shall leave you with A Year in the Life of the Festinio and Welsh Highland Railways. More videos and details about that below. Thank you.